Recently, youth on social media and, uh, more importantly, reputable publications and journals have taken a keen interest in the alleged antidepressant effect of some topical drugs. The overarching inquiry is primarily founded upon new clinical trials which examine the use of ketamine as a novel treatment for alleviating major depression. This talk will hereafter revolve around the physiology behind interventional ketamine use and the ways in which taking the drug might exert a therapeutic antidepressant action. Characterised as a dissociative anaesthetic, ketamine is widely used recreationally for inducing an overwhelming feeling of relaxation and sedation, which can provide an out-of-body experience which is otherwise known as the K-hole. Ketamine was popularised as a club drug shortly after its approval for human use in the 70s and was later classified as a Scheduled 8 controlled substance, perhaps in response to the abrupt increases in recreational use. The drug is often administered intranasally and orally in social situations, however, it can be injected intravenously and intramuscularly in clinical circumstances. Ketamine consists here of a chlorobenzene, secondary amine, and a cyclohexanone, which translates to this or that. Ketamine is an NMDA receptor antagonist, which refers to an ion channel and glutamate receptor protein, which is found in nerve cells. NMDA, once bound by glutamate and glycine simultaneously, permits the entry of positively charged ions to flow through the cell membrane. NMDA has two types of competitive inhibitors, uh, one which is the glutamate inhibitor and also one which is the glycine inhibitor. NMDA also has a non-competitive inhibitor, which binds to an allosteric site of the protein, and also an uncompetitive inhibitor, which acts as a channel blocker. Our lovely friend ketamine is a non-competitive antagonist. So why do we care about ketamine's non-competitive inhibition of the NMDA receptor? We care because the aforementioned simultaneous binding of glutamate and glycine and the resulting influx of cations is responsible for initiating a special signal transduction cascade. And this cascade is crucial to higher functions such as learning and memory. This cascade, beginning with the activated NMDA receptor, produces an excitatory postsynaptic potential. This leads to an increase in the concentration of calcium ions within the neuronal cell. These calcium ions thereafter function as secondary messages in various signaling pathways. So this means that the antagonism of NMDA by ketamine will reduce excitatory synaptic activity, which would cause the loss of responsiveness that is associated with clinical ketamine anesthesia. This has been known for a long time, but however, subsequent work has found that ketamine exhibits a much wider range of differing molecular effects which expands into a notable role as a rapidly acting antidepressant. The immediacy of NMDA blockage is remarkable, but cellular functioning consists of much more than just the functioning of an ion channel. Ketamine disrupts a larger number of downstream, more lasting processes, which led to its classification as a rapidly acting antidepressant. The duration of these effects lasts for about a week, which is much long after the drug has been eliminated from the body. So having touched on NMDA, how does this hypnotic effect lead to an antidepressant action. A growing body of evidence suggests that an increased prevalence of BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, could be mediating the pathophysiology of various mood disorders. BDNF plays a critical role in the survival, maintenance and growth of the brain and peripheral neurons. Reduced brain BDNF levels have been found in post-mortem samples from depressed patients, whereas brain infusion of BDNF produces an antidepressant-like effect in rats. Ketamine here facilitates the desired neuronal plasticity in brain areas implicated in major depressive disorder, including the hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, and striatum. In addition to the effect of upregulated BDNF, the cascade also acts on mTOR, or the mechanistic target of rapamycin. So mTOR is a protein kinase that has broad roles in the regulation of cell growth, proliferation, motility, survival, and most notably, protein synthesis, which is expressed in the formation of dendritic spines. Uh, And dendritic spines are the physical sites of synaptic connections. An increase in functional neuronal plasticity, which was implicated in BDNF upregulation, is commonly accompanied by an increase in the number of these spines. Moreover, dendrites and spines of the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus in stress-related illnesses such as depression are indeed prone to atrophy. As with BDNF, Post-mortem samples also reveal that there are notable deficits in mTOR signaling, specifically in the prefrontal cortex of depressed patients. Hence, the antidepressant actions of ketamine in increasing neuronal plasticity 
could thereby be achieved in part by the mTOR signalling pathway. In summation, we firstly have ketamine, which antagonises NMDA, which leads to the increase of intracellular calcium, and via a cascade leads to BDNF release and neuronal plasticity, which is otherwise known as synaptogenesis. We also have mTOR, the upregulation of which leads to an increased translation rate of dendrites and spines, and this results in greater plasticity of the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, and ultimately an antidepressant action. Since publication of the first randomised controlled trial describing the rapid antidepressant effects of ketamine, several reports thereafter have confirmed the potential for treatment for depression. However, given the lack of an active placebo and limited data on long-term outcomes, it remains that there must be clear guidelines for clinical administration of ketamine in the short term.